Thanks for joining us. I'm your host, Raquel Faria. I am a doctor in internal medicine at the Centro Hospitalar Universitario de Santo Antonio in Porto. Today, I'm joined by Professor Sandra Navarra and Ronald von uh, Volhaven from the Lupus Academy Steering Committee, who will be providing expert insights from the key research and clinical data presented at the 15th International Congress of SLE, held in Korea in May 2023. Sandra and Ronald, welcome, and thank you so much for joining us today. Before starting the discussion about the data presented at the Congress, I'd like to know what was your global insight of the meeting? Ronald, can you please start? Oh, shall I start? Well, um, thank you for asking. It was really a great pleasure to be at the International Lupus Congress, which was organized this year in Seoul, South Korea together with the Korean Congress of Rheumatology. So it was a combined Congress and it was very well attended. There were, I think about 1500 people. I didn't, I, I didn't count them myself, but that's what I heard. It was done in a wonderful, beautiful Congress venue in a modern part of Seoul. And the organization was just um, uh, superb. And uh, I have to give credit to the, the chairs of the Congress, but also everybody involved in the organization of it. A real joy to be there. Sandra. Uh, yes, absolutely, absolutely. And I agree with uh, Ron on that. And in addition to the beautiful setting and the uh, uh, perfect organization, um, it was nice to, to uh, see the, the you know, both East and West coming together, and that was in person, face to face, after the three years of pandemic, um, and it highlighted also similarities, similarities and differences over all the program in, in lupus uh, across populations in the East and in the West, and also differences in in treatment. It was it was also wonderful if you look at the posters. It was wonderful to see more and more young people, young clinicians and researchers participating. And then they were supervised by the, the uh, older and senior uh, consultants. But there were a lot of young people and it just felt gratifying and fulfilling to know that, you know, we have a lot of potential there for the future of lupus uh, research. Good. Yeah, I felt that same way also because it was indeed uh, many years that we couldn't have these kind of meetings. And now... Um, it was possible again, you know, the, the, the International Lupus Congress is every two years and two years ago, of course, it was done online. It would have been in Italy, but it, uh, it couldn't be done because of COVID. And interestingly, the theme of the Congress was actually an end to the war and it had three meanings. One was the sad truth, which is that the war in Korea has never really ended. It's been 50 years now since the armistice. So for our Korean hosts and those who attended from Korea, that was, of course, very much in their minds. But also the very hopeful thing that the war against COVID seems to have resulted in what we can call a very good success for the medical and the care systems that have, in fact, gotten the pandemic under control. And then, of course, the war against lupus, which is what this Congress was about and where we really hope that we're now seeing dramatic improvements in what we can do for the patients who are affected by this disease. Good, thank you for that. In during the Congress, there were several presentations of uh, observational data on the burden of SLE and its unmet treatment needs of patients and positive findings with clinical trials, such as the PASLI trial, which offers insight on the future treatment and bring hope for patients with SLE. Of course, we, we won't be able to discuss them all. And we are sorry if you are listening to us and we didn't choose your Congress presentation to discuss. So, looking at the research presented on disease burden in SLE, that was a, a really in the Inspire prospective uh, court study, the inception um, SLE court in India, that showed uh, the that in 2000 patients with SLE that are registry, 9.7% of the patients can have gastrointestinal manifestation. It's a rare manifestation, but it's really a burden of disease. And it occurred uh, 
early in the disease course and associated with higher SLE activity, higher percentage of myositis in lupus, which is also a rare manifestation, and increased mortality. Sandra, can you please comment on this and what is your experience with GI involvement in SLE? Uh, yes, it's nice to see data like this, and this is a large cohort of uh, over 2,000 patients. Um, and, and it gives us uh, a better uh, bird's eye, better view of the GI involvement, which we know is the, one of the most non-specific manifestations that we have in SLE. So the challenge there, if you have a GI involvement in a patient who is with lupus, is actually the attribution to SLE. And this is, and, and most of the time we attribute, you are only able to attribute this to lupus if your patient also has active disease in other organs. And uh, the, other, the other clue that this is part of lupus and not, you know, other non-specific uh, involvement like appendicitis and all that is because it resolves, the GI manifestation resolves with immunosuppressives. So the, the challenge will always be attribution. But I, I don't think, and even secondary to medications, not necessarily to lupus disease. Yes. So I thought that was, uh, uh, that was a, a, a nice uh, presentation on the cohort of 2,000 patients in, in India because it also highlighted that, um, you know, when you have S, uh, GI involvement in these patients, it was uh, associated with higher SLE disease activity which is uh, one of the clues that we have in clinical practice, that the GI manifestation is due to lupus and not to other factors like, like drugs or, or some other non-SLE uh, involvement. Uh, Rob? Yeah, so, yes, yes so this was an interesting presentation. It just underscores how international the meeting was, but also how international the research in lupus now has become. It's really a global effort. And this report from India underscores this aspects of, of lupus, which may be different in terms of the prevalence, but it certainly occurs in patients everywhere. We also see it in Amsterdam. Uh, patients can manifest with abdominal symptoms, with motility disturbances, with pain, with uh, in dysfunction of the uh, organs of the gastrointestinal tract, such as the liver or the pancreas. And all these manifestations are, uh, you know, uncommon, but I would say that this the report actually also underscores that we should be alert for them. And like Sandra Navarra was already saying, it's always diagnostically quite a puzzle, but we should not underestimate the impact. These can be very important manifestations of the disease for the patient. It is clear that some of them will respond very nicely to treatment, even uh, fairly rapidly, but others may actually pose very long-term term problems. And we, <clears throat> I'm sorry, we have some patients who, unfortunately have uh, become very chronically dependent on uh, measures such as additional nutritional help or otherwise because of the motility problems that can be irreversible. So for these patients, I think it is very good to have recognition, to be alert as a clinician if the abdominal symptoms or gastrointestinal symptoms are not resolved or explained easily by some other mechanism that it could be lupus related. We should also recognize that gastrointestinal is one of the few manifestations of lupus that's not captured in the SLE day, um, but it's still a very legitimate lupus uh, activity or can be. So um, we should not forget about it. And if we were speaking about uh neuropsychiatric lupus, we would say, okay, there are symptoms, we are trying to capture them, but we know that the physiopathology beneath it, it's different. So trying to just switch it to the GI involvement, we have serositis, lupus entritis, lupus vasculitis. So do you think that is this all the same? Can we have different phenotypes that would, would be explained? How do you think that we could um, try to treat each of these parts? Of course, this is not studied, but with your clinical insight, how do you think we should try to figure out between these kinds of involvements? Wrong. Yeah, certainly I can um, 
start by commenting on it, but it's clear that these are all very different manifestations and also underlying pathophysiological processes. So there is certainly an inflammation possible in all the layers of the, uh, the gastrointestinal tract itself at all the levels, stomach, duodenum, ileum, and colon. And then there could be the serocytes of the abdomen, so a sort of like a sterile peritonitis or an uh, autoimmune peritonitis, of course, very different. And then there are the, the organs of the gastrointestinal tract, the pancreas, the liver, gallbladder, they can also be affected. So obviously this has to be diagnostically fully explored if the patient presents with symptoms, what is going on. I think that what we don't normally do a lot of is the uh, is a pathological diagnosis and maybe there is a, there is room for improvement there. If patients do have the involvement of the, for example, the duodenum or the ileum and that to know if the inflammatory process is in fact in all the layers uh, of the organ or perhaps focused mostly on the mucosa, which in some instances has been described in some series of patients and uh, is actually quite serious. And it would maybe be important because you could say that for those patients with the more more serious manifestations, um, early intervention with immunosuppressives or biologicals could be actually indicated. And these all kind of manifest with abdominal pain and uh, abdominal cramps or diarrhea or just not feeling good. So Sandra, how do you think uh, we should uh, approach this with a patient and we know it happens uh, on the first months of presentation and the patient is starting new medications for lupus uh, if we have diagnosed the activity. So how do you think that in a clinical uh, practical approach the patient comes with abdominal pain and we have started some medications. How do you think we should valorize these and what kind of imaging or exams we could do uh, in the clinical uh, setting? I, yeah, uh, more than imaging, more than doing uh, diagnostic imaging, it's really evaluate your manifestations. You know, we, we know that uh, the abdomen is always a temple of surprises. And uh, temple of surprises, it can be anything. And uh, many times the, the manifestations can be, uh, again, unspecific. So overall, when you treat a patient with lupus who has GI manifestation, so you still treat the lupus. And then see if your GI manifestations will resolve. Of course, always keep in mind that many of these GI manifestations can be due to medications. So you may need uh, to uh, look at that as well. Okay, thank you. Let's move to another presentation of a retrospective Korean cohort analysis from uh, cardiovascular manifestations. And this is quite nice and interesting because the, 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 the population that was studied with lupus was compared with a population with diabetes and general population. And the cohorts that were compared were SLE patients that were diagnosed after 40 years old uh, with the general population and diabetes that had more than 40 years old. So after adjusting for confounders, the degree of increase of cardiovascular risk was higher in lupus patients than diabetes patients. So this is huge. Diabetes is a classic uh, cardiovascular risk and this work just showed that lupus is worse even when it's diagnosed after 40 years old. So Ron, do you, this is a Korean population-based study, but are you aware if we also have this data for the Western population, for example? So yeah, absolutely, yes. Um, cardiovascular disease has been studied in a great deal of detail. Um, the SLIC group, which is this international consortium, has published very extensively on cardiovascular comorbidity and mortality. Look, this is, a, this is a tremendously important point because we do know from prevalence or from epidemiological studies that lupus patients have a higher mortality. They die and it's about twofold, even in countries with good healthcare and access to medications, a twofold increase in mortality for lupus patients in general. And it actually is highest, the, the, the relative increase in the younger patients, although the absolute numbers, of course, are at the higher age. But there's still this excess mortality. Why is that? Some patients die from the lupus itself, from a manifestation in the heart or the lungs or the, the brain. But that's not so common. But mostly when patients with lupus die prematurely, 
it is due to comorbidities and cardiovascular plays a, plays a very big role in that. Now, the studies such as the one that you mentioned and that was presented at the International Congress in Seoul or studies that have already been published all point to the same fact. There is a cardiovascular component to the lupus itself, but quantitatively more important is the fact that classical risk factors are increased in the patients with lupus. And they do include diabetes, which you just mentioned, but also hypercholesterolemia, hypertension, and there may be other uh, classical risk factors that can also play here. And the question is, what do we do about it? And we have absolutely um, made headway in this because we see that the cardiovascular morbidity and mortality has decreased over the recent years and decades, but we can still do much more. We need to be very much on the alert for our patients and intervene whenever possible. Sandra? Do you also yeah. think it suffice for the Asian population? And uh, actually, we are talking about diabetes and lupus with comorbidities. And I, the T to T strategy just applies for diabetes. So, what to? Where are we on the T to T strategy to approach this in SLA? No, it's not even just talking about T to T. We know that uh, this data is not un, uh, unexpected. This is something that we expect in lupus because in lupus. You have inflammation, you have systemic inflammation that leads to your vascular disease. Whereas in diabetes, you know, it's more straightforward. So diabetes is actually more straightforward. It's a vascular disease and therefore you get complications generally because of your vascular and increased atherosclerosis. In lupus, you have the element of inflammation. You have systemic inflammation. So it's a, it, it, that's why you have accelerated atherosclerosis. So that makes it more uh, complicated uh, in, in terms of the approach there. And you have to address the inflammation in patients with, uh, with lupus. Uh, you don't address inflammation in patients with diabetes. Now, nonetheless, uh, when you have treat to target, of course we have treat to target. So in diabetes, you have treat to target for your diabetes. And you have, again, very straightforward measures, outcome measures that you'd like to, to achieve in your patients with diabetes. In lupus, again, it's different because it is not just the cardiovascular. It is not just a vascular component, but also your other organ activity, the other inflammation. So that is, you have more targets. You have an overall target that includes the several, several measures to consider in patients with lupus. So um, uh, a bottom line is whatever it is in lupus, uh, uh, the, there is always that we have limitations in clinical practice in achieving T2T because for the simple reason that it's much more difficult to achieve T2T in patients with lupus compared to the more straightforward disease like diabetes mellitus. But bottom line is still, uh, I absolutely would like to reinforce what Ron said about, you know, we have to recognize these patients early and treat them early aggressively. Remember, you're talking about an inflammatory disease from the onset. So treat the inflammation, put out the fire before you, you destroy the, the whole organ systems in patients with lupus. So T to T or treating to target is very interesting that you mention it here because it actually comes from the world of internal medicine. Uh, diabetes, of course, if you treat diabetes based on some sort of idea of what kind of patients' uh, symptoms and, and what they experience, you're not going to get a good result. You get much better if you have a clear target in terms of the um, hemoglobin A1C or something like that. And so we copied that model into rheumatology, including for rheumatoid arthritis and psoriatic arthritis. And we think for lupus, it's also very appropriate, but of course the targets will be very different. Uh, but the principle is very straightforward. You have to know what it is that you want to achieve. And then of course you have to do something to achieve it. And perhaps most importantly, you have to then also assess if it has actually worked, if you were able to achieve the target, and then you have to choose the interval for how long you give it. So sometimes it's okay to, to already check after a few weeks, sometimes more often after several months, sometimes even longer. So that depends on what the intervention was. And also very important, if you do not achieve the target, you have to try something else. Um, now I want to emphasize that it does not always mean that you have to discard what you were doing and start something completely new. It could also be just an adjustment, for example, a dosage adjustment, or maybe some more emphasis on, um, on uh, lifestyle measures. It doesn't matter what the intervention is, but it does matter that we have to try to achieve 
those targets for diabetes, absolutely, for hypertension, for uh, cholesterol, but we have to also try to achieve the target for lupus. Yeah, but the, lupus, the, the thing with lupus is that it's, it's much more complicated than that. And every patient presents with a different uh, set of manifestations or involvement and different set of responses compared to other patients. So again, that makes it, uh, we have to emphasize that the T2T in lupus is highly, highly, highly individualized. And you have to have more variables and factors. And sometimes we're trying to target one uh, target that you choose on the last clinical and a clinic. And today the patient presents with another manifestation. So you need to readjust your target. Ronnie you wanted to add something. I just wanted to point out that we've never let ourselves be stopped by something being complicated. So we, <laughs> we have to do it. And, and, uh, and, but, and, and, but you're absolutely right, Sandra, that this is, of course, much more complicated than in a, in a straightforward uh, disease like diabetes. But what we can do in lupus, because we have actually very good outcomes already that could be the targets. So the lupus low disease activity score, which was developed actually by you, Sandra, and other colleagues in Southeast Asia and uh, with a lot of work in uh, Australia, that actually is already a very good instrument for establishing that the patient has a low disease activity, which is a very good target. And of course, uh, Sandra, you and I together and Raquel in a, in a big international consortium also established a good definition for remission, which is even the better outcome from the patient's perspective, what they really want, what we all want, that the disease is completely under control. And uh, we can now also define it and that makes it possible to also work with it in practice. And we can right. move in this topic to one of the best uh, practice presentations that was the uh, prospective C-star registry that shows that you can discontinuate glucocorticoids when the patient is clinical casent, serologically active or serologically casent. And this was actually a, a good point to, to, to reinforce one of the main targets when the patient is clinical in remission and we need to discontinuate glucocorticoids. So they showed that if the patients discontinue steroids when they were clinical case and serologically active or not, they had less damage, global damage, less renal damage accrual and less mortality. So Ron, this reinforced the target of steroid steppering in your clinical practice, because this, we are always talking about this, but it's still an emergent point on the clinical point of view. Patients are used to do steroids. Doctors are com comfortable with five milligrams. In your clinical practice today, 2023, how are you tapering steroids? <sighs> Well, uh, you should be aware that uh, tapering uh, glucocorticoids is one of the most sort of uh, individualized things yes. that there is in medicine <laughs> and also which is really the art of medicine and not the science of medicine. There have been international groups that got together to define the best way to taper and they were not successful. And we in Amsterdam, we have our clinical protocols. And I think we have six different protocols for tapering <laughs> glucocorticoids. All depending also, of course, a little bit on where exactly, why exactly the glucocorticoids were given and for what particular indication and the clinical manifestations. But it has to be individualized because the patient may to, to very, uh, very varying degrees have uh, side effects and uh, risks from the glucocorticoids. So in that sense, it is not possible to say how we do it. But I think your question was also a little bit, do you feel is it's important to taper down from 10 milligrams a day to five milligrams a day? And the evidence is yes, it is very important. It's even important to go from 7.5 milligrams a day to five milligrams a day because the risks become less. And this is very well established. Where the controversy may lie is how important is it to taper down from five milligrams a day to less or even to zero? Yes. And that was in the study that you just mentioned that it, it can be done, but as the study also confirmed, some patients will flare. So yes. this is actually very tricky because then with five milligrams a day, the risks are not so big. In fact, there was a study done in rheumatoid arthritis and recently published with a lead investigator, Martin Boers from Amsterdam and Zoltan Sekanets from Hungary. And they showed that this um, uh, dosage, the five milligram dosage, is 
to some extent effective, not very effective, mind you, but it has some efficacy, but it also is quite safe. It has a little bit of an increase of infections and some other things. So it's a very precarious balance. And I don't think we have a full agreement on that yet. Sandra, one of the things that we, we would agree on definitely is if you can remove them out of steroids better. So the earlier you can remove your steroids, the better. So that's still your goal to bring down to steroids to even zero. And even patients would appreciate that. So many of our young patients with lupus, though, they don't like, they hear about the steroid side effects and as much as possible, please, let's bring, let's bring down our steroids. And you get their cooperation with that. The problem, the issue, again, is still, you know, a, a, a lot of beautiful studies coming up with how to paper. You have steroid sparers, of course, your hydroxychloroquine is there. Now, the issue here is where you see, I personally just, just was watching the, uh, uh, the lupus conference and, and uh, you witnessed there the disparities between the East and the West, uh, settings wherein you have uh, access to steroid sparers, uh, their rainforest, especially, especially uh, biologics. And we have yes. hard, good, hard evidence that the biologic agents, the new agents, are really very effective steroid sparers. But then what about the access? We don't have that in limited resource settings like third world countries, especially in our part of the world. So that becomes one of the things that we need to address in our part of the world. And how do you do that? Uh, again, here is where uh, you have factors like um, healthcare policies and, and talking about uh, education. So uh, that has to be addressed. And, and in my part of the world, again, the, the challenges are different from what you have. When you have a, a biologic, like for example, belimumab, it's not, it's not reimbursed. And even immunosuppressives. So these are out of pocket expenses. Uh, one of the, um, I, I did give a presentation during the Lutus conference also on, on uh, limited resource settings. Uh, mm -hmm. So, and here you can see that even the WHO has emphasized the fact that in third world countries, uh, the, the, um, the uh, household budget that, uh, uh, that is spent on health care alone, on medical care alone, exceeds, and this is in third world countries, uh, exceeds uh, or goes as far as even 40% of household budget goes into medical expenses. So uh, it, it is, uh, it's a major challenge, especially in the air. But as Ron was saying, you know, we never let these challenges uh, bring us down in terms of planning and, and uh, we, we look at them as look at the opportunities and the opportunities here would be education. So again, education, uh, bringing it to health uh, policy makers, uh, uh, making sure, and here's where also your uh, uh, GC, uh, CPG, your clinical practice guidelines, once they are there, they're evidence-based and bring it to the health uh, uh, policy makers, uh, uh, bring it to the attend their attention. That is important for we're making sure that you have universal health care for our patients, especially with lupus. Yes, and it's early recognition and training rheumatologists, training good lupologists. So physician and uh, patient education, they are so important in lupus. And also in the education of physicians and also the communication with patients, we do have uh, an unmet need that was addressed and presented in a nice work with a small amount of patients, but a nice work from the Duke University, where they address the, the medication adherence and the strategy to change it. And so the aim was to first assess the, the, the adherence to medication and then do an intervention with a high quality patient provider communication. And actually, it maximized adherence. So, Sandra, do you have any specific methodology to assess adherence in your patients? Uh, do you do it in your clinical practice? It's, it, it's the easiest way to do, but there are other uh, instruments and um, other, physici other physicians and other uh, HCPs that could help with this. What are the medications that you are more prone to ask for adherence? Uh, 
Yeah, adherence is so important, and we know that. Uh, uh, now, what was um, I, I, the one, the small, the small study that was done in Duke University? You know, that's an academic setting. Mm-hmm. In the real world, these things don't happen, especially in our part of the world. Your shortages of rheumatologists, pathologists, you don't even have a nurse to educate the patients. Yes. So you have to be creative uh, in how to do this. Uh, um, you know, let patients uh, support groups are so important. Because if, if patients educate other patients, they coach other patients to do this. And that is actually much more effective than, than the physician mm-hmm. uh, teaching patients or, or telling them. What. So, um, and that's not even, that doesn't mean an academic setting. So, um, again, it's, it's different in my part uh, of, of the world. And I'd like to hear from Ron. Ron, adherence. How do you address adherence in the ideal setting? Well, so this may be an interesting topic where I think the, the, the listeners will maybe realize that Sandra Nevera and Rekla Faria and Ronald Van Bollenhoven agree on many things, but not everything. And so <laughs> I, do, I do think that obviously we agree that adherence is important, but the thing where we might disagree and also other experts, how much of this is the responsibility of the physician, of the specialist? And how much is the responsibility of the patient? And of course, it's a shared responsibility, but I do think that sometimes we're placing an undue burden on our own colleagues for saying that, well, you know, have you really done everything you can to improve adherence? And I think, well, yeah, you can do a lot of things, but in the end, you know, in the end, it is the patient who has to be adherent and they need to be informed. They need to, they need to understand why. Um, and I do think we're sometimes also as doctors a little bit. So on the one hand, we're, we're telling ourselves, oh, we have to do this. And then we are worried that we don't have time for everything. But also we sometimes are not quite honest because patients sometimes figure out things about their medications that we don't quite figure out ourselves about practical issues. So I, I do think we've, we spend time informing patients. We have nurses in our clinic who spend time with the patients on the practical sides of medications, you know, especially with biologicals, the patients need to be instructed. And this also helps reinforce the proper use. Um, um, but we don't go as far as was done in this study where we would use special instruments or, you know, or make it into a huge program because we frankly feel that we need to put our energy also on many other things as well. And I think that Sandra just stressed one of the important things that uh, Jeanette also uh, told on a previous podcast that patients listen better to another patient about this than they listen to the, the physician. So the patient support group are really a good tool for, for this also. Thank you for that uh, discussion. It was really, thank you, Ron, because it just break the thing and unburden has on it and the education, the patients, representative and associations are also very, very, very important in this. So there were also clinical trials with very promising uh, drugs. Uh, updates on the trials of the Ducravacitinib, Litifilimab, Nipocalimab, and the analysis of the predictors of placebo response in SLE clinical trials were also present. So I'd just like to know your comment on a particular presentation that studied the standard of care harm on the placebo harm on the phase two trial of dapirolizumab pegol that found that acute flares with normal complement levels predict a high placebo response in patients with SLE. And it may be important to consider patients' recent medical history when defining study populations for SLE clinical trials. So, Ron, can you please comment on this placebo response? And this particular point of uh, flesh with normal complement. What yeah, do you I feel can, I can comment on that, uh, Rekha. I, I can comment, but let me first start by saying that the Congress was very exciting also because so many new treatments are now showing really good promise and we're hopeful that we'll have better treatments in a few years time. Um, but as to the placebo response, look, if you design a clinical trial, you always want to think how can we minimize the placebo response because if the placebo response is very high then it's hard to see the effect of the intervention um, and this has been a source of concern for clinical trials and lupus where sometimes the 
the um, placebo rate is very high, and people have wondered why is that. And one of the reasons may, of course, be that patients have this. Uh, in, in lupus, some patients really have flares and then quiescence, and that's the course of their disease. Mm-hmm. And so if you take them into the trial, at the moment they have a flare, and then obviously they're going to go in quiescence because that's what they always do. It can look like a placebo response. So the report that you mentioned, uh, Raquel, was not so surprising to me because the patients who is tended, tended to flare but then also have resolution and be in remission again spontaneously, that patient will most likely have a very good placebo response. I think this is also why in clinical trials, we often look for patients with persistent disease activity despite you know, conventional treatment. Sandra, can you comment on how to overcome this? Uh, oh, I, I would defer to Rowan on this. <laughs> I absolutely agree with you how, how difficult it is to design these clinical trials. But we are improving and we could see that. So as more and more of these clinical trials come up with the results and discuss how can we uh, decrease the placebo response, um, yeah, we're, we're learning and we're even having better outcome measures. So Absolutely, we are we are definitely getting better. Um, so I think that the the whole field of clinical trials has been moving, but it moves slowly because of the fact that it has to be right for you know it has to be right for the patient who participates. Yes. It has to be right for the investigator. It has to be right for the company that sponsors it because in the end they are doing it for a reason, and the reason is of course that they would like to prove that their drug is effective and then get it approved, and that be and that becomes an issue where the regulators. For example, in Europe, it's the EMA, and in the United States, the FDA, and of course, in uh, in the Philippines, it's yet a different agency, and they have their own ideas about this, and they are very important. So, I hope that we can still work together with all these stakeholders to make the trials better and better. And almost finishing, I'd like to know uh, if you had other presentations, other news of the Congress that. Uh, Spot that you want to spot uh, on these that we haven't discussed yet, Ron? Well, actually, we already covered a lot of ground. And as I just mentioned, I was particularly encouraged by all the developments in therapeutics. So we, we, we of course, are all aware that um, fairly recently, a second biological was approved for the treatment of lupus and afrolimab after already many years ago, bilimumab. Some biologicals are also used off-label, but what is encouraging to me is how many new treatments are now in phase three clinical trials. Of course, it poses a problem because all those phase three trials are very big trials and they need lots of patients and they need to include, and that is a challenge. So I hope that we can all work together and getting the patients to participate into trials so that we can find out what the best options are going to be just a few years from now. Sandra, do you want to highlight? Um, I I absolutely agree. And uh, uh, in the clinical trials, the challenge will always be, you know, it's not, it's never, never a uh, one, one drug fits all. So the, the selection, patient selection is so important. The trial design is so important. And uh, it is nice to know that many of these, even the methodology have improved, the outcome measures have improved, and um, a lot of effort is going to this. Uh, the other thing that uh, we we also would I, I would like to look into in the future is seeing more of these established registries across populations. Mm-hmm. So lupus registries because they they show you and they highlight what would be the need for this particular population, what is more common for this population, what is the usual outcome for this population. So how sicker are these populations uh, in terms of their lupus? So we need more of this data in the future, and we hope to be able to establish more, more registries across across the globe. Thank you, Sandra and Ronald. Thank you so much for joining me today and sharing your insights to our listeners. We hope these discussions have helped you gain more of an understanding of lupus. Please download the Lupus Academy Fifth International Congress Meeting Highlights Report from our site. A link can be found in the show notes. Thank you so much for listening. We hope you enjoyed this podcast. Please leave us a review, which will really help us in reaching as many of your colleagues as possible around the world.